On to chapter six. Alternative and evolving construction trends. Your objectives for this chapter. Describe the difference between prescriptive design and performance design. List four common alternative building construction methods. Define the term green construction and explain what is meant by advanced framing methods and list several features of advanced framing methods. The four sections in this chapter are performance design has nothing to do with firefighting, two, alternative building methods, three, evolving building methods and materials, and then of course your chapter review exercises. In this chapter, when they're talking about economical and environmental friendly building methods, they're more focused on the energy use issues in terms of insulation and how efficient the home is, as well as the indoor quality and such things as water waste and pollution reduction in terms of the green blueprint. As well, they look at the material and its suitability in terms of being environmentally friendly as well as being energy efficient. When we look at the traditional building codes, they were based on a prescriptive building approach, meaning that the code told the contractors exactly what materials were to be used and how to assemble them to build the required structures. This building method was particularly great for firefighters because it created a certain standard to an era or design code and allowed us time to analyze, plan, and figure out the fire dynamics in those particular structures. However, the code has since changed where now it's more of a performance design building approach where the codes basically say we don't care how you build it or what you use. They only care about the end result, meaning will it hold up to certain given conditions, whether it be fire, structural integrity, um, energy efficient, ratings, and things of that nature. Now this was good and bad. Good in the sense that it allows for innovation in constructing new and modern buildings. It gives the engineers and contractors free range to choose products and materials and methods to complete the job. That can be more cost effective and more eco and economically friendly. Unfortunately, this has opened up Pandora's box in the sense that now we have all of these different ways to build a building and it makes it virtually impossible for firefighters to stay abreast of all the current changes in these different construction methods and how they will respond and react in given fire conditions. So even as this text is brand new, it's probably already outdated uh, because somebody somewhere has thought of a new way to build a better mousetrap, so to speak, or in this case, a better building. Alternate building methods can simply be defined as building construction materials, assemblies, and systems that are non-traditional, usually innovative, or do not readily fit into the five classic NFPA types of buildings. When you're looking at alternative building methods, one of the major components is, of course, lightweight steel, because most Alternative construction buildings include lightweight and engineered elements, which equates, of course, to, as we said before, reduced integrity and firefighting time under fire conditions. So with this lightweight steel, it allows for reduced cost, significant weight reduction, ease of installment, and resistance to termites and molds. 
The non-combustible materials are used to help satisfy the requirements for certain occupancies. However, the problem doesn't lie in the components that they are using to build these structures, such as the lightweight steel. It's more focused on the contents in the structure. Begin because of all the plastics and polymers that we use, these fires burn quicker and hotter. And unfortunately, this lightweight building material, such as the steel, doesn't withstand to fire as well as the traditional lumber configuration. So it allows the steel, of course, to warp and bend and give way relatively easily. So let's look at insulated concrete form, known as ICF. And there are three different setups here. But insulated concrete form is a newer concept method that was initially developed in Europe after World War II as a cost-effective method to replace and rebuild damaged buildings. ICF buildings are those that use permanent expanded polyesterine EPS forms for poured concrete and come as panels, planks, or blocks. Essentially, you have this plastic coating that is on the outside and then on the inside they pour in concrete to give it structural integrity. The ICF blocks traditionally started out in the 1960s to 1990s and they were used for foundations primarily. And then it started to spread to exterior walls uh, as high as three stories high. Uh, after that you're looking at having them reinforced with some use of uh, rebarb or steel. One thing that makes these blocks so advantageous is they're lighter than traditional concrete and they have greater insulation properties so it gets a higher R rating meaning that they're more airtight they don't let cold air in and out and things of that nature which also creates a problem for firefighting because again you're not going to be able to see the smoky conditions as they really are or the heat because everything's trapped inside so that also makes the fire vent driven as opposed to fuel driven and sets up a high potential for backdraft in these type structures unless they are properly vented. The first type is flat panel. This system uses interlocking flat panels of the EPS to form a mold wherein a solid mass of concrete is poured. The voids between the EPS panels are spaced using some sort of plastic or, or coated metal plates, which helps ensure uniform thickness of concrete. The plates are also used to support window frames, conduit, and piping that runs that are installed prior to the concrete pour. These lap panel systems yield a continuous mass of concrete like a conventionally poured foundation wall. The concrete is very thick with high aggregate content, so it provides a fairly resistive mass for prolonged integrity under fire conditions. It's important to remember that with flat panels, they are made up of approximately 80% concrete and 20% of EPS and steel. Make sure you know the difference between each three. The next type is post and beam. The post and beam system creates just that. A concrete post and beam skeleton. This system is formed by using a combination of the planks and panels to form the hollow molds for the concrete post and beams. The molds are interconnected to solid EPS blocks that create the wall, essentially the infill, and serves as the mounting surface for interior drywall and exterior finishings. The finished post and beams will range from 40 to 60 percent concrete. Notice that is different from the 80 percent of the flat panels. The final one is grid blocks. <clears throat> the grid block system is one where like EPS blocks are stacked and interlocked and they use in the book the example like Lego blocks to create a wall. The EPS blocks are designed with internal cavities 
to create continuous vertical and horizontal channels for the concrete. Once bored, the concrete form a lattice or a waffle pattern that is encapsulated by the EPS. Steel rebar is typically added to some of the cavities prior to being poured to give strength in areas around doors, windows, and corners. The concrete used to fill these cavities has to be a high slump, meaning free flowing, with minimal aggregate content. So when finished, the grid blocks wall is primarily EPS or form material with as little as 20 to only 30 percent concrete. Overall this system is quite fire resistant so it allows firefighters more time. The problem comes into play with the lightweight floors that they often uh, stand on so those will give way first or the ceiling also, the problem is the plastic poly coating on the outside, of course, is going to burn hotter and quicker and release toxic gases. So it can also aid to flash over in the room a lot quicker than traditional building materials. Also, when the casing melts and burns it leaves the rebar in the concrete of course exposed to high temperatures and it loses some of its integrity issues so that could also lead to a potential early collapse the next type of interesting building method is the structural insulated panels or SIPs and what these are are two pieces of oriented strand board and in the middle of them they fill it with like a plastic foam type substance so it provides great insulation and these things are already pre-made and they're shipped to the site where they're lifted into place by a crane and then they have like a tongue and groove kind of system where they join together and then they use glue and another piece of OSB board to help secure these forms together to form a complete wall. In the text, it's kind of interesting that this originally was designed as a method to replace roofs rather than walls. And that's in your conventional type three <clears throat> and type five buildings. And that was due to help eliminate heat loss. So keeping this in mind, you can see how these things can be great for energy efficient and insulation as well as um, help making the home extremely airtight. Unfortunately, when we start looking at some of our issues, as you can see here with the photo on the right, notice how the electrical conduit box is kind of encased and cut out and, and nestled in the insulated foam. Now, if there was to a, a shore or fire to break out, now you have this foam burning in this concealed space, which may be hard to detect. Of course, the other problem with this is the OSB itself. Now, as we know from our other chapter, OSB is basically wood chips that have kind of been um, glued and, and pressed together. Now structurally it's sound and tight but when you start exposing that glue again to fire conditions such as high heat then the glue is going to start breaking down giving way the OSB is going to start burning and then the wall loses its structural integrity and then as I said before uh, once the styrofoam inside there kind of melts away it creates a large combustible void space where you can have hidden fires and then they can run the length of the walls It is important to note because of the high insulation properties, when you pull up on scene, you may notice very little or if any smoke in the resonance or the structure. So you want to approach with caution because all that heat and smoke are going to be trapped inside. Again, this is another possibility for potential backdraft. As always, anytime you have a synthetic substance burn especially like this polystyrene it will release extreme toxic gases so if there's anyone in the structure uh, they're going to probably quickly succumb to the smoke and fumes from the toxic gases 
So definitely don't be doing salvage and overhaul or, of course, you know, interior firefighting without proper protective equipment such as SCBA or air filters during salvage and overhaul operations. The next building method that they talk about are straw bale buildings. Now, I have never seen an actual straw bale building, though I'm on a quest now to find one just because reading this has really piqued my interest. Basically, what they do is they take straw um, and not grasses like hay, um, alfalfa and oats and grains, things you eat. They say that straw is more durable. And essentially, all they're doing is compressing these bales together to form bricks. The best way I can kind of equate this is like looking at a bale of pine straw and using that to uh, kind of build a structure. Obviously, um, it's not pine straw, but they also compress them together to give it integrity. And they either use the roof or some sort of wood beam box that they kind of tighten it and, and compress it together. Or they use compression straps. Now... In terms of firefighting, straw itself or a hay bale, if you've ever fought a fire that had one of those combusting, we know that they're very tough and, and they're very slow burning because they're so dense and packed together. Though once the fire gets started, usually it's internal and you have to break the bale apart, which makes um, salvage and overhaul a nightmare in order to get these fires out. So the concept would be the same in these straw bricks. You're, you're literally going to have to rip apart the wall to get to what is burning. Some other issues is, of course, collapse. The real collapse threat with these particular straw bales is found with the roof. The lightweight roof or collapse threat on any building. The live roofs traditionally that these things have create an unusual heavy dead load which can cause a more rapid collapse. Of course we also add water which gets absorbed into the live roof and we'll talk a little bit more about a live roof but basically you're looking at something that has a roof that's more eco-friendly whether it be gardens, plants, uh, saw, whatever the case may be. So what actually gives way is not so much the, the walls, it's the roof, and then when the roof starts giving way, it's going to push out on the walls. And then once it begins to push out on the walls, those wood beam uh, rods and compression straps end up giving way, which lead to total building collapse. In the same category, you have these straw and clay buildings, and essentially what they do is they build a traditional wood frame, uh, what we see with our traditional type 5 construction, and then they fill in the voids with this straw-clay mixture to make bricks, and of course they give it strength through compressing it down, either by the roof or the tie rods, uh, again of that nature, and essentially all they're doing is taking the straw and they're coating it with clay and then packing it down and then allowing it to dry. Important to note that it could take a year or two for these things to dry and cure out. Again, fire hazard with these still is mainly the roof and content. The, the box itself or bricks itself aren't relatively going to burn as easily as the content and the roof. And then of course once the roof begins to give way, it's going to force the uh, walls to begin to push out and eventually give way. One of the biggest debates in this chapter is green construction. What really is green construction? And I like the approach that they take uh, where it's not really considered a type but an idea or approach. And, 
It's up to the builder and the engineer to basically create something that is earth friendly, saves energy, it recycles or repurposes things, it's health conscious, things of that nature. So you can have any kind of mixture of modern building construction techniques with this green construction techniques and you can call it, oh, hey, this is green construction because I'm using uh, energy efficient uh, interior bricks and you know I've got a vegetable garden on the roof and solar panels etc and then of course that adds additional weight to the roof which is a whole different problem in terms of uh, our increasing dead load to me in, in short green construction is anything deemed eco-friendly and that's kind of a broad category So again, just to recap on the green stuff, there's a whole list of different types, and I'm not going to go into all of them. You can read them uh, from the advanced framing methods to double stud walls to radiant bearing sheeting, green insulation, cool roofs, live green roofs, and electro smart glass windows. So again, Ultimately, these are all features that help the environment by saving energy or reducing the, quote, carbon footprint. So let's look at advanced framing methods. And advanced framing methods revert, refer to a variety of wood framing techniques that reduce the amount of lumber used to construct a wood frame building. Advanced framing method is also known as optimal value engineering and is the result of a partnership between the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the National Association of the Home Builder Research Center. The basic premise of this is to reduce the amount of thermal bridging, and that's the movement of heat through framing members, and the amount of lumber used to construct the wood frame building. So, for example, the corner where two wood frame walls intersect is often built using three or four studs. With this new method, it replaces this with two studs per corner. Other features could include such things as stud spacing to increase from 16 inches on center to 19 and a half or even 24 on center. And the wall uses a single two by four for a top plate. Um, you can look at on page 132 and hear the, the design. So essentially all we're doing is maintaining the integrity but spreading out and reducing the amount of wood now unfortunately when you do this you're also going to be reducing its resiliency to fire because now we're spreading out the load and we don't have as good fire breaks uh, or compartmentalization in terms of the modular construction of the rooms but said, you know, we're going green, so the framing technique is environmental friendly and uses 10 to 30% less lumber and has a faster construction time. It also saves energy and reduces framing factors by 15 to 25%. So it, it's easy to see how this newer version of construction technique um, would be advantageous for the builders because, hey, we can build it quicker, we can build it cheaper and it's you know environmentally friendly so all the excuse me for saying tree huggers are happy about that unfortunately as i said it's not going to last long exposed to fire the next system is the modular panel system like the um, concrete box with the foam or not the concrete box foam the osb boards with the foam this concept creates the panels off the job site to form low bearing walls. The thermal steel system uses a galvanized steel frame with carbon fiber reinforced form panels to fill. These panel systems are basically again sandwiched together with steel wire and some sort of uh, sprayed on concrete to build these forms. And it's basically kind of spread on 
using some sort of like air compressor so they're, they're essentially spray painting the these wire mesh blocks with the coating the next system is the building block system and essentially what they're doing is making blocks that again are kind of connected like legos which making them lock together so you don't have to use as much mortar to bind them together now if you don't have as much mortar then obviously these bricks are going to be less resistant to fire and there's a whole section here on the autoclave aerated concrete blocks that they use for this in terms of what they're made and how they're made and how they're glued together and they also have some steel rebar in there to help with you know the structural integrity of those high stress areas such as corners and again underneath windows doors um, certain key framing places finally we have the engineered wood system and the engineered wood products have begun to provide a new perspective on the use of wood especially when used in place of concrete or steel materials although engineered wood products offer many advantages over the conventional materials remember that they universally use adhesives of various compounds many of which are capable of softening when exposed to heat and fire emitting toxic gases that are of course detrimental to fire ground personnel as well as anyone that may be trapped inside and the two main types you have are the cross laminate timber and the fiber reinforced products and again these are synthetic wood systems that are not really wood uh, like the OSB board, you're looking at various materials getting pressed together using some sort of adhesive. They're extremely durable, they're lightweight, and they're energy efficient. But again, since they're held together by glue and things of that nature, it makes them really heat sensitive. So again, when they're exposed to heat, you're looking at toxic gases and possible collapse issues. Now I want you to read over the case study for the foam house. Think about the questions and be able to justify your answers. On your exam for this chapter, you will have a question or two based off the case study. Okay, so for this chapter, make sure you do the chapter review exercises and answer these questions. Again, make sure you think about the case study on 135 because you will see those questions again in your unit exam that covers this chapter. Also for chapter seven, I'm not gonna do a formal lecture because that was kind of covered in your NFA class. And if you haven't done it, you really need to go ahead and get that done and in. If you're having issues, they've got technical support for you. So until next time, be safe and have a wonderful day.